This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, today we're going to talk about dwelling coverages. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have a tough time with the dwelling coverages, the different homeowners policies. We're just going to do dwelling today. Um, when you hear dwelling coverage, think of it's a landlord policy. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to mute you real quick. Hold on. Uh, all right, there we go. Uh, so think of a landlord policy. So you own a building and you rent it out to other people. Uh, and so this is a type of program that's for that. Um, homeowner, homeowner's policy, it's got to be owner occupied. You own it, you live in it. Uh, dwelling or landlord policies it may or may not be owner occupied, but for the exam, dwelling coverages are typically not owner occupied. All right. So what that means is um, you're going to get some contrast comparison questions and you're going to get one like a per prospect would purchase a homeowner's policy instead of a dwelling policy for which of the following reasons. And the answer is because you want broader coverage because a homeowner's policy is a package covers property theft and liability. And then another question says a prospect would purchase a dwelling policy instead of a homeowner's policy for which of the following reasons. And the answer is, is because they don't live there. Okay, so there's like two questions that you possibly will get on the test. You'll probably at least get one of them. Uh, most of you will probably get both, to be honest with you. So again, when I say dwelling, think of your landlord. Okay, may or may not be owner occupied. For the test, it's not owner occupied. All right, uh, and it's one to four family living units. So with a homeowner's policy, you can buy a homeowner's policy on a one to two unit structure, like a single family home or even a duplex. All right. Um, but with homeowners, you got to live there. So if you own a single family unit and you don't live there, you're a landlord and you rent it out, you have to go to a dwelling policy. Now, if it's a threeplex and you live in one of the units and you rent out the other two units, uh, since it's more than two units, you cannot get a homeowner's policy. So you're going to go to dwelling again. Okay. So remember, it's up to, whoops, it's up to four family living units. So it's like a fourplex. If it's larger than four units, the next step is you're going to go to a business owner policy. A business owner policy is for up to six stories high, up to 100,000 square feet, and up to three million in annual revenues. Okay. Um, and anything larger than that, then you're going to go to a commercial package or commercial policy. Right, so, uh, but again, one to four family living units and it's only property. So whereas a homeowner's policy is property, theft, and liability, dwelling is only property. So it's, it's kind of a monoline policy and you can add other coverages, right, but it's going to be additional charge. So there are three basic cause of loss forms, basic, broad, and special. All right, you got to get the cause of loss forms down because it's very common to have that on the test. Starting with the basic form, uh, it covers fire, lightning, and internal explosion. Right. Personal property is optional. I doubt you'll get this on the test. Okay. Additional living expenses is optional. This may show up on your test. Uh, how, how additional living expenses may show up on your test is, you know, what is covered under a DP2 or a DP3 that is not included in a DP1? And additional living expenses would be commonly be the answer for that one. It's optional on the DP1. Okay. Now, if this only covers fire, lightning, and internal explosion, it's not a lot of coverage. So for a slight additional charge, you can add extended coverages. Now, extended coverages is a package of seven additional perils. And I'm going to use abbreviations, WARVs, W-H-A-R-V-E-S, WARVs. Uh, w is windstorm, which covers, of course, wind damage. Hail covers loss due to hail. A is for aircraft, not the one you own, but an aircraft crashes into your house and damage your house. That's how you want to understand that. Uh, riots, R is for riots. Uh, maybe there's a peaceful demonstration it gets out of hand and a riot ensues. That would be covered. Vehicles would be the V. Um, now, again, it's not the vehicle that you own. Right? Someone else without insurance drove through your living room and the vehicle damaged your property. That's what we're talking about. Uh, e is for explosion, right? whether internal or external. And then you have smoke. 
Um, and with smoke damage, I always say a two-story home suffers greater losses than a one-story home. Because with a two-story home, if there's a fire downstairs, it'll create smoke damage upstairs. But if there's a fire upstairs, when the firefighters put the fire out, it'll create water damage downstairs. Okay, so that's kind of what that's about. And so extended coverages is a package of seven additional perils. If you buy extended coverages for an additional premium, you can then purchase vandalism and you'll see vandalism and malicious mischief or VMM coverage. Right? Um, so that means, you know, someone vandalizes your house, but there's a 60 day limit. That means if your property is left vacant or unoccupied for more than 60 days, we will not cover vandalism losses. See, if no one's watching your house for a two month period of time, it's going to become a target for vandals and that's increased risk to an insurance company. And so therefore they're not going to cover vandalism if the property is left vacant or unoccupied after 60 days. All right. uh, but this is a basic form. It's very limited. All right. Oh, uh, here we go. Uh, I did go in and add extended coverages. Remember the windstorm W H A R V E S wharves. You need to know what these seven perils are. All right, so you get the basic form for additional charge, you add the extended coverages. A lot of times the test will ask you which of the following is not an example of an extended coverage peril. So if you know these are windstorm, hail, aircraft, riots, vehicle, explosion, smoke, then you know that earthquake and flood are not one of the extended coverage perils. That's how you want to understand that. All right, so that's the kind of uh, questions that you're going to get when you take your exam. All right. So you buy the EC and then you can buy the vandalism and malicious mischief. Or it's every once in a while on the test, you'll see it listed as VMM. All right. But again, if the property is vacant or unoccupied for more than 60 days, we're not going to cover vandalism losses. And this holds true for commercial property coverage also. If you have a commercial building and it's vacant for more than 60 days, we're not going to cover vandalism losses. All right. Uh, you may get a question on the difference between vacant or unoccupied. Uh, think of you own a cabin up in the mountains. Vacant means it's just an empty cabin. You don't keep anything there. That means when you go visit the camera, you bring or your cabin, you're bringing all your furniture and clothes and food with you. And then when you leave, you're taking everything with you. So it's just an empty shell of a cabin that's vacant. Unoccupied means there's contents there. So now you've got this cabin up in the woods uh, that you leave furnished. So that way you just kind of roll in with your food and beverages um, and then you leave. And so there's contents, but nobody lives there regularly. So if the property is vacant or unoccupied for more than 60 days, the insurance company will not cover any vandalism losses. So either get a house sitter or check up, have someone check up on the house periodically to make sure no one broke in. Okay. Um, but that's what that is. Now, rather than buy a basic form and add the extended coverages and for additional premium, again, add a, a vandalism, just buy the broad form, a DP2. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to cover all the basic forms, all right, the basic perils, fire, lightning, internal explosion. It, it broad form includes extended coverages and vandalism automatically, but it's also going to give you additional perils. And so the basic form is a name peril form and it's very limited. Broad form is a name peril form. It just covers more perils than the basic form does. Right? Um, and I've emphasized, I mean, there's like nine additional perils above and beyond this, but I've emphasized, whoops, uh, I've emphasized these three perils. The reason I did that is because on your test, again, you get those comparison contrast questions. Which of the following would be covered under a DP2 or a DP3 that would not be included on a DP1? And so falling objects, collapse, and burglary are covered on the DP2 and DP3. These are not covered on a DP1. So I don't know which question you're going to get, but it will say, you know, what's covered under a DP2 that's not included in a DP1. You get fire, lightning, internal explosion, and collapse. Okay, so collapse is not on a basic form, all right? Or it might be falling objects, all right? So you got to know the difference between the DP1 and DP2, or I should say, know the difference between basic and broad, all right? So then the third one is the special form. 
and anytime you see special form, think of op, um, all risk or open perils. That means we cover anything you could possibly imagine that damages this property other than this list of exclusions. <clears throat> the common exclusions are catastrophic like earthquake and flood. Okay, Now these two you can actually buy back because you might have earthquake coverage available in your state. Uh, and flood insurance is offered through the federal government if you live in a designated floodplain. You might see floodplain or flood zone. Uh, for the test, you have to live in a flood zone to get flood coverage. By the way, the flood zones are set by FEMA. Don't think your insurance company sets floodplains. No, FEMA, right? the Federal Emergency Management Act um, or Association, they set the flood zones. Okay. Uh, so these two you can buy back. Nuclear risk will not be covered. If you're a large company, then it's possible to get it. But you and I as homeowners, no. Okay. Uh, war is not covered also because these are catastrophic in nature. They do not lend themselves to any predictability. Right? And therefore, insurance companies don't want to cover these. Uh, the other two would be wear and tear, which is never covered by insurance. And intentional acts. So you have a policy, times are tough, uh, in a drunken fit, you just kind of light your house on fire. That's an intentional act. That's not going to be covered by insurance. Okay. So intentional acts are not covered. All right, so these are your common exclusions that are found on your special form. So remember, basic is good, broad is better, but special is the best if you're a, a landlord. Okay. That's why you want to know that. That's why you want to know that. I'm going to mute there. I'm going to mute there. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So under property coverages, you need to know the coverage parts. Coverage A is a dwelling. And so you can see this house in the background. It's a duplex, right? Anything bolted, welded, nailed, attached to this structure would be coverage A. And so we have to calculate how much would it cost to rebuild this structure. That's going to be coverage A dwelling. And we'll keep it simple. We'll say it costs $600,000 to rebuild this building. Okay. And so coverage A limit will be $600,000. All right. Coverage B is other structures. That would be the fence. Um, you know, maybe they have a separate garage around the back. That would be coverage B. You might see other structures or you'll sometimes see it as separate structures. Right. Uh, and the standard limit is automatically 10% of whatever we came up with under coverage A. All right. So if coverage A is 600,000, 10% of that is we're going to give you 60,000 for the other structures. Right. Like I said, the fence, the gazebo out back, maybe you have a shed, a pool, a pool house, that's 60,000 is what we'll give you for other structures. All right. Now, the dwelling and other structures are what we call real property. Those are structures on the premises. Um, so, yeah, and that would be direct loss. So, Covered C is personal property, and your personal property is covered anywhere in the world, all right? Um, and the standard limit would be 50% of whatever we calculated for coverage A. So if we're saying it costs 600000 to rebuild the house, we give you 600000 if your house is destroyed, up to 600000 I should say, uh, 60000 which is another 10% on top of that, uh, to cover other structures, plus 300000 right? 50% of the 600000 uh, 300,000 to replace all of your belongings. This is easily movable objects. This would be like your clothes, your furniture, your pots and pans, your salt and pepper shaker. Anything that's easily removable would be covered C. It is covered anywhere in the world. Under dwelling coverage, there is a bit of a reduction of coverage if property is away from the location of the home. Uh, but in general, 50% of coverage A is a good amount. These first three items are what we call direct loss coverage direct physical loss, damage, or destruction to your property. Okay. Um, and if you had a fire, now we got to go into the indirect loss coverages. So if you're a landlord and the, ha the place burns down that you were renting out to other people, well, those people that were renting from you, they cannot live there anymore. The, the property is what we call untenable. It means they're going to go live someplace else. And if they're going to go live someplace else, they're not going to still pay you rent. But you relied on that rental income to cover your bills. Right? And so if there is a direct loss, then the indirect loss coverage like rental income could replace the 
renters income that they would normally pay if they were still living there. Okay. Uh, when I say rental income, it's, it's lost rents minus discontinued expenses. If you ever see discontinued expenses, it means utilities. We're going to pay you missing rents minus gas electricity because nobody's there using gas electricity and your renters, they, wherever they go, they got to pay for gas and electricity, wherever they go. All right, so that's what lost rental income is about. Now let's say you live there. All right. So let's say you had a threeplex, uh, you lived in one unit, you rented out the other two. And if the place burns down where it's uninhabitable for you, you need money to stay someplace else. Well, that's what additional living expenses is all about. Providing you with money to put you up at a hotel, right? Um, to rebuild your property and you can move back in. Again, these two are indirect loss coverages. A, B, and C are direct loss coverages. A and B are real property. And covered C, personal property, is also called contents. You do need to know uh, A, B, and C. Okay, you do need to know what A, coverage A on a dwelling policy is what? Coverage B on a dwelling policy is what? Coverage C on a dwelling policy is what? So you got to get that down. You also need to know that uh, coverage B is automatically 10% of coverage A. And coverage C is 50%. Oops, uh, sorry. 50% uh, of coverage A. And so this is a difficult test because you got to memorize stuff. And, and you don't like the detail of memorizing all these bits and pieces and parts of this particular policy. But to pass this test, you got to absorb that. So the tricky part is anything bolted, welded, nailed, uh, bolted, welded, nailed, or attached to the structure is coverage A or B. If you flip the house upside down, anything that falls is covered C. That's how you want to know it. Now, where they throw a curve at this at you is they'll say a can of paint on the premises would be covered by what? Well, when you think a can of paint, if you flip the house upside down, the can of paint would fall. But the can of paint is not meant to stay in the can. That paint is meant to be on the wall. And when that finished product paint is on the wall, when you flip the house upside down, that paint will stick to the wall. Therefore, paint would be classified as structure, not contents. Um, and this is where the test kind of trips you up a little bit. Okay, because you think can of paint, flip the house upside down, it's going to fall. Yeah, but it, it's meant to be on the wall. And when it's on the wall, when you flip the house upside down, it's going to stick. That's why it should be coverage A, dwelling. Your clothes would be coverage C. And yes, you need to know that coverage C is personal property. Because they might say, you know, what part covers, um, you know, your salt and pepper shaker? And they'll say part C. So you need to know, need to know part C is personal property. So you got to get these down. That's the detail associated with this test, which a lot of people don't like. Like I said, most people are conceptual. You pay a premium, loss occurs, you file a claim, the company investigates and pays a claim. That's it. That's a concept. But this test, the property and casualty exam, you got to get detail. You got to get parts. Okay. All right. I got to raise hands. Sophie, Sophia, let me unmute you here. Sorry. Right. Hi, just, a, hi, just wanted to go back to the um, basic and broad forms. Um, yep. What is the difference between DP2 and DP3? Did you mention that? Cause I don't, uh, I kind of confused. So DP2 is a, a name peril form. Broad form is name peril. DP3 is all risk or open peril. Okay. Okay. So a DP2 broad form, like so basic and broad, they list perils that the policy covers. Uh, DP3 or special form lists exclusions or perils that the policy does not cover. So they're kind of opposites of each other. All right, one lists what we cover. The other one lists, we'll cover everything except this list of exclusions. Okay. So DP3 is just what we do not include. Yeah. And isn't there like a DP four, five, and six and whatnot? No, not for dwelling. For homeowners, okay. there is HO one through HO eight. Oh, okay, okay, got okay. it. Thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, but I doubt you get a question on HO one. Okay. On a whole, even, so we don't even sell it here in California. Some states still do, but um, most people haven't saw an HO one question. 
Uh, they do get an HO8 question, which is kind of funny. It's a modified HO1 for antique homes. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, all right, no worries. Yeah, yeah, bug me, ask away. All right, no. cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna lower your hand here. I'm gonna see if I can. Haha, -ha, there we go. All right, <laughs> learning some of these uh, ways of managing this. All right, so so remember that dwelling policy is only, only, only property coverage. So, for a slight additional charge, you can add liability or theft. And so, think of think of dwelling is you're going to a restaurant, and there's an a la carte menu where you can pick what type of burger you want. You want the hamburger, that's a DP one. You want the cheeseburger, which is a hamburger with cheese on it. That's a DP two. It's a little bit better. Or did you want the gourmet burger? right, which is, uh, you know, the hamburger with the cheese and bacon and, and grilled mushrooms, or whatever, um, that would be the DP3. So hamburger's good, cheeseburger's better, but the gourmet burger is the best, right? So basic, broad, special, that's how you want to know. Now, knowing, you know, picking out a hamburger, depending on what you want, did you want fries and a shake, All right? Well, the fries, that would be your liability coverage because it's optional under a dwelling policy. And then the drink or the shake would be your theft coverage, All right? So these are additional charge. So remember I said homeowners is a package that covers property, liability, and theft all built in. So it's like going to that restaurant and getting the combo plate. The burger, fries, and the drink is all packaged up and it's cheaper that way, All right? So the optional coverage is we have a personal liability or you might see CPL. The test does throw some acronyms at you. So if you see CPL, know that they're talking about comprehensive personal liability. Uh, people look at CPL and they say, what is that commercial property liability that, you know, no, 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 don't, don't read it that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, liability for business is general liability, not personal liability. Uh, but personal liability covers you and your family members anywhere in the world. In case you accidentally injure someone anywhere in the world like you're taking a vacation in Southern Italy and you shank the golf ball and hit some guy in the head, um, the liability from this policy will cover you anywhere in the world. Medical to others, it's usually a thousand to 5,000. Th think of this as the ambulance ride. You're having a cocktail party at your house. Someone slips and falls, they hit their head. Um, and so this is going to be the ambulance ride to get them to the hospital. And then the personal liability covers their medical and their lost wages because they're unable to work during this time while recovering from this accident that happened on your property. Okay. Whenever you see L for liability, think L for lawsuit. Someone got injured or you injured someone accidentally and now they're going to sue you to pay for it. And it may not be bodily injury. It could be property damage too. Okay. But that's the liability coverage. Theft. We have two types of theft coverage, broad theft and limited theft. If the property is owner occupied, you can get broad theft, right? Which means it, it's going to cover more. If if it's not owner occupied, so you, you're a landlord uh, and you don't live there, then you can only get limited theft. All right. So know the difference between the two. Broad theft is owner occupied dwelling. Limited theft is non owner occupied dwelling. All right. Um, so let me explain. If, if it's a three unit or a threeplex, you live in one unit, rent out the other two, you want broad theft. You know why? You have stuff there. Right? Someone could break into your unit and steal your clothes, your, your furniture, your pots and pans, or your jewelry, whatever you may have, right? And so you want the theft coverage. But if you, if you have a building like a fourplex and you don't live there, you rent the whole thing out, then you only need limited theft because you don't keep stuff there. The only stuff there would be appliances. I don't, I don't think a lot of people want to steal appliances. You know, if you want, you can add it. Okay. Um, or like a lot of landlords do, they just self-insure appliances. All right. Something happens. They'll just go wherever, um, I don't know, what would offer up and go buy a used washer and replace it. Okay. So, I mean, it's an option. So these are optional as a landlord. Okay. So remember for a landlord, it's like a single family home, a duplex, a threeplex, or even a fourplex. Right? Actually, that might be a duplex, but we'll say it's a fourplex, okay? So um, yeah, one to four living units. If it's larger than four living units, then you go to a business owner policy. 
remember that's up to six stories up to 100,000 square feet uh, and if it's larger than six stories 100,000 square feet then you're going to a commercial package policy okay um, when you register for my site you're going to see this is one of the documents that I've kind of put together uh, yeah basic is good that's a DP1 broad is better but special would be the best okay all of them have the five coverages whoops uh, but remember uh, DP1 additional living expenses is optional but a DP2 and DP3 it's built in okay uh, the basic form DP1 covers fire lightning internal explosion uh, the DP2 is a name peril form, and it covers the basic perils plus extended coverage and vandalism and some additional perils. So it just, it's a name peril. It just covers more than this one. So this one's good. This one's better, but this one's the best because we cover anything that could possibly happen to your property except for this small list of exclusions. Okay, so that's the DP3, the special form. Um, removal is more of a situation than a peril. Um, if there's a fire, first thing you do is get everyone, you know, that you like out of the house, <laughs> call 911, and then run in and maybe grab some of your belongings and bring it out of the house and put it in the driveway or your neighbor's yard to protect it from the fire. This is, of course, without endangering yourself, okay? And we will cover your property during this period of removal, um, for either five days on DP1 or 30 days on all of our other policies. All right, that means the dwelling policy doesn't cover theft. Theft, theft is optional, that's down here, okay? During removal, if your house is on fire, you get out of the house, call 911, you're running back in, grabbing your stuff, you're putting it in your driveway, you're running back in to get more stuff, and when you bring it back out, the stuff that you just brought out on your first trip is gone. That means people are stealing your stuff when you're taking it out of your house. So even though a dwelling policy doesn't cover theft, during removal, you have all risk coverage. And so unavoidable theft during removal is covered. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of what that's about. Okay. Um, for basic, remember it's name peril. We pay actual cash value for the structures and contents. Um, the broad and special form, we give you replacement costs for the structure but there's still actual cash value for your contents. So actual cash value is like used value. So replacement cost, we're gonna rebuild your house brand new, or the building brand new, that's replacement cost. Actual cash value- for DB2? All the stuff in your house, yeah, in a DB2. Uh, uh, we're gonna give you a depreciated value for your personal belongings, like your clothes and your furniture, okay? All right, All right. ask that question one more time, sorry. <laughs> Was that for a DP2? Yeah. Okay. okay. DP2 and DP3 as far as, uh, yeah, replacement cost for the structures, actual cash value for contents on both of these. Because for the test, they asked, they did ask a couple questions about actual cash value, and I wasn't sure what dwelling policies were actual cash value or replacement cost with the continents. I just was unsure. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, DP1's actual cash value. Uh, DP2 and 3 are replacement costs for the structures. But all of them are actual cash value or used value for your belongings. Okay. Cool, okay, cool, cool. thanks so much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one more thing. Um, I, I call it other structures. Or you'll see separate structures. Once in a while, coverage B on your test is called a pertinent structure down here. Okay. Your test goes crazy with the thesaurus. So instead of saying other structures, you might see a pertinent structure. That's another name for, you know, that fence out in your backyard or the, the you know, the, uh, the shed or the gazebo. That's what that's about. Okay. Uh, remember, uh, liability is optional. Theft is optional. All right. Um, but that's basically it. It's like going to a restaurant, getting an a la carte menu. You, you want a burger, the cheeseburger, the gourmet burger. And did you want fries and a drink with that? Uh, the fries and a drink we can add for additional charge. Okay. That make it a little easier? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm writing this down. So I just want to make sure I'm writing it down correctly. Uh -huh. So for a DP1, it's actual cash value on the personal property as well as DP2. 
And DP3 yeah. is the replacement cost on that personal property? No, DP3 is actual cash value on your personal property. So all of them cover, give you actual cash value or used value for your personal property. Okay. It's the coverage on the structure. Uh, DP1 gives you actual cash value for the structure, but DP2 and DP3 give you replacement costs on the structures. Oh, okay. That's that makes so difference. much more sense. Okay. So, I mean, realistically, if your house burns down, you want the house rebuilt. That's replacement cost. But all of your stuff in the house, we're going to give you used value. Okay. Um, there's some endorsements you can get, typically with a homeowner's policy, where you can get replacement cost coverage on your personal property. Uh, but typically, for the test, not going to be for a dwelling policy. Okay. All right. So that's kind of how that works. If you haven't registered, go to lgdstudy.com. Uh, lots of sample test questions. But when you're studying with my website, follow the instructions when you register. Follow the instructions on the email. Um, I, you, I don't want you to test yourself. So when you go through my material, the sample test questions I have, the correct answer is already highlighted. I don't want you testing yourself. And this is, this is difficult for people. I always tell people, be open, be coachable. Uh, I'm not here to teach you everything in the world there is to know about insurance. My job is just to teach you this is what you need to know to pass a test. And the easiest way to learn what you need to know is, is don't test yourself. I'm giving you the question. I'm giving you the answer associated with that question. So you, when you read this question, this is the answer you want to look for. Okay. Um, the reason I do that is you got to look at your study habits. But if you did the standard uh, testing yourself way, this is what happens. You read the question, you read all the answers, you think about it for a little bit, and then you pick one, uh, which you think is the right answer. Now, when you pick that answer, you just imprint it in your brain. This is the answer that goes with this question. And that's an imprint. And then you move on to the next question, you finish the quiz, and then you grade the quiz. And even though you go back and look at that question you got wrong, you don't imprint the correct answer. So the next time you see that question, you typically pick the exact same wrong answer you picked because in your mind, you were right when you picked it and you're going to fight tooth and nail that you're right. And so why would you want to fill your head with wrong answers? Don't. I'm giving you the question. I'm giving you the correct answer. Okay. You just need to make that association. When I see this question, this is what I got to look for. All right. Uh, along with that, I have an online playbook. The weakest spot for most people when they take this test is the basic concepts and definitions. All right, that's the property basics and the general insurance section of the test. And that's in the playbook. All right, now, as much as you could Google definitions like what is aleatory adhesion, Google's going to give you a general definition. In my playbook, I have the definition worded the same way the exam does. And so it's going to look familiar to you. Um, some of the terminology and the language that's um, on my site, it, it doesn't quite make sense. Because, man, and you, nobody talks like that. Eh, you're right. Because you're learning a bunch of stuff just to pass a test. But when you sell insurance, you're not going to use that language. You're not going to say, hey, this is a great policy. It's a contract of adhesion. You're, you, that's not, you're not going to use that terminology. But you got to get the understanding of the concepts so you understand how the policies work. All right? um, there's some charts just like the dwelling chart we just showed in the previous screen. Um, I've got charts to show you the differences in the homeowner's policies. Um, the commercial general liability versus commercial crime coverage, and, and there's a lot more. And at the bottom, I've got a lot of recorded webinars. And so in going through the questions or if you've taken the test and you realize, man, you know, I, I don't know homeowners that well. Great. Watch the homeowners webinar to kind of brush up um, because I'm, I, I try to be pretty thorough with my webinars to give you a better understanding. So I don't care where you, where you did your required licensing hours or your required course. I, I don't go through that. OK, um, I, I simplify it to this is what you need to know to pass the test. In most states, all you need is 70 percent. That's a C minus. In California, you only need 60 percent. That's a D. Uh, it's not an easy D. All right. Uh, again, you got double negatives. All of the following are incorrect except. 
Uh, you've got, they go crazy with the thesaurus. I mean, what is inherent defect? What is inherent vice? I mean, nobody talks like that, right? But that's going to be verbiage they use on the exam. And so you got to put in some time, do your due diligence um, to focus and study. Okay. Um, I look at it as a, it's a short-term loss for a long-term gain. It's a short-term loss to kind of put some social uh, uh, items aside for a little bit to study and pass this test. Because once you get this license, you now have uh, a license that can give you unlimited income potential. All right. And if you love building relationships and helping people, this is a great license to have. Okay. So with that, I'm going to step down. Anyone have any additional questions? I have kind of just a random question um, about the the actual test when you go um, take it. Yep. Is there like multiple time windows to take it or is it just like one test per day? Um, you know, they, they do have multiple time limits. Um, typically, I've seen like 8.30 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 6 o'clock in the evening if you're going to a physical location. Um, if you're doing it from your home, um, they do have more options. But if you're doing it from your home, understand you are watched like a hawk. Um, mm -hmm. Any type of noise, they want you to pan the camera. Um, even if you have a runny nose, I had someone was saying that, man, they couldn't even grab a tissue uh, <laughs> because they're thinking you put notes on the tissues. Um, you can't speak, even though you're in a room by yourself at home, you can't speak. You know, like some people, they read the questions and they'll whisper it or they'll read it out loud because, you know, in my mind, there's no one else around me. Why wouldn't I be able to read it? They're saying, no, you, you got to be totally quiet because uh, they're thinking you're reading the question to someone who's going to help feed you the answer. Um, so there's, it, it seems to be a little more stressful taking the test at home. Um, so I would probably recommend going to a facility, uh, put all your stuff and belongings in a locker, uh, get checked in, um, sit in a, a desk with um, some blinders on. Uh, they do have headsets, I believe, that you can use. Um, I'm not sure if they took those away because of COVID. Um, uh, they still yeah. have them. Do they still have them? Okay, good, good, good. So, yeah, I wasn't sure if they pulled those away because COVID, you know. So, so, I don't know how they sanitize those things. Uh, so, um, but, uh, you know, you just go in there, you focus, you take the test, and you get out. Okay. Um, and that's a lot easier than, you know, every once in a while you got to pan your room. Um, when you do it, the home test or at your office, I mean, if a cat walks by, they'll, they'll, they'll cut, they'll close out the test because they think that you tape the answers or questions or material to the cat. Um, it just, yeah, it's how just too much stress from what I'm hearing. How much time do they typically give you or give us? Um, it's 150 questions. You typically have three hours to do it and they'll give you a little extra. Um, I think you get 160, let's see, um, uh, what, three hours and maybe 20 minutes. Um, because even though you're graded on 150 questions, they're going to give you like 160. So those 10 additional questions or new questions that they wrote. And they threw them in there to see how you do. Um, and if 50% of the people can't get them correct, then they eventually will rotate and actually become part of the test. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the latest test questions, as far as feedback I got, is uh, something about a state of emergency. So I believe if the governor declares a state of emergency, what is the time period for this? And it's actually 24 to 36 months. Okay. I had to look that up. Um, I don't know if that's one of the 10 questions that they're just seeing how people do on it or if that's an yes, actual Yes, I actually question. got I got that exact question. Yeah, uh, so it's like 24 months, uh, maybe extended to 36 months. Okay. Yeah, but that's, that's one of the latest uh, feedback items I just got back. So, so now you know, huh? So when you go see the test, oh, state of emergency, 24 months. Uh, 24, I think 24 to 36 months. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. What's crazy is they are, they have two pet insurance questions that they count on your test. Um, and, and you can't even sell pet insurance with this license. I don't get that part. Uh, but it, when you get to the pet insurance question, just think of health insurance for you and your family. You're just covering a pet. Okay. So you go in, there's a deductible, there's a co-insurance, right? There's limitations on certain types of losses. Uh, pre-existing conditions aren't going to be covered. I mean, stuff like that. Okay. Um, and I did pull yeah, some. One of my that was one too? Question that I got was, 
um, I believe it was what is excluded in pet insurance. Is it the gender, the breed, the cost, or something else? What is excluded in pet insurance? Oh, um, oh I'd, I'd, I'd have to say anything that's associated with pre-existing condition. Before they it was gender it. cost, gender cost, um, and I forgot the other one. So it can't be gender. Cost, I don't know. I don't even know why that would be listed there. Cost is not excluded. There may be limitations on the cost. Okay. So, but it's typically for dogs and cats. Okay. All right. All that additional information for a dwelling coverage. So, <laughs> all right. But I'm here, folks. Any other questions, bring them out. I'm sorry. I feel like you've answered this question before, but um, do you mind retelling me the retractive date and discovery period? Because I was driving home and I couldn't write it down. Okay. Um, so you want to go with, uh, let's go with commercial general liability. There's two ways of writing commercial general liability. There's occurrence made and claims made. All right. So occurrence made coverage, think of, it's like auto insurance. All right. Um, let's say you have a policy in force, you get into an accident today, but your car is drivable, right? It's late in the day. You're not going to bother your insurance agent. So you drive off, you guys swap, swap information, you take off. Um, Friday, your policy renews. And either you renew it with a new policy with the same company, or you actually leave this company and you go to another company and start a new policy with that new company. And then Monday, you realize, I better report this. So Monday, you call your claimant. Which policy is going to cover your accident that happened today? The policy that's in effect today when you had the accident, or the policy that's in effect Monday when you're calling in and filing a claim? Now, under occurrence-made coverage and auto policies, the policy that's in effect today pays the claim even though you filed the claim after the policy ended. All right? That's how you want to know occurrence-made. Claims-made coverage, think of health insurance. So you hurt your back five years ago. You know, you're feeling okay. You're buying a health insurance policy today. Two months later... For some reason, your back's really bothering you, and you go to the doctors and you file a claim. They do some tests, and they say you need surgery. Well, which policy is going to cover your surgery? The original policy was in effect when you first hurt your back five years ago, or the health insurance policy that's in effect today when you're filing the claim? Well, under claims-made coverage, it's the policy that's in effect today, right? So that means in buying a claims made policy, you set a date back in time, right? And we cover from that day, let's say eight years prior to today, right? So July 19th, um, 2014, okay? So you put that as a retroactive date. That means in buying this policy, we cover you from July 19th, 2014 to today plus the next year. And so claims made coverage, we can cover stuff that happened before you bought the policy, as long as it was uncertain. Okay. But also with claims made coverage, when the policy ends, you know, you still have uh, what's called an extended reporting period. And it's the mini tail is 60 days. So after coverage is canceled or ends, you still have up to 60 days to file a claim for a loss that happened when this policy was in effect. So what happens is you have a policy, a loss occurs, but you didn't realize it, okay, um, until coverage ends, and then you, you let's say, that you, someone stole from you, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go, well, no, let's back it up, so we're in liability. So you have, a, a, you're, you own a restaurant, you have a commercial general liability policy covering the restaurant, um, and someone slips and falls on the second to last day of the policy, Okay. Uh, you, you fill out an answering report, but they say, you know, I, I'm okay. And they, they leave. Um, two weeks later, they come back. Right? Remember, this is two days before your policy ends. Um, they slip and fall. Um, policy ends. Two weeks later, they come back and they say, you know, that slip and fall really, my back is, is still hurting me. And so now they're filing a claim. 
And if they file a claim within 60 days of that policy ending, since the loss occurred during that policy, then we'll go ahead and cover that claim. So the extended reporting period just gives them additional time to file a claim to have this policy pay for it. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that help out? Yes. And so okay. in that time when they um, realized that they did have an accident during that time, is that the discovery period? Um, the disc whenever you hear discovery period, think of a bond. Um, like I said, a fidelity bond. Let's say you have a business and you bought a fidelity bond in case your employees steal from you. You want to protect yourself in case your employee steals. Okay. Um, and so it's you have a, a retail store where you have inventory and a loss occurs uh, during the year and you didn't realize it, uh, but the bond ends. After the bond ends, you do an inventory and you realize, wow, we, we have a shortage. Okay, so then you investigate the shortage and you realize someone stole from you. And so the discovery period on a bond is when a bond ends, you still have up to one year to file a claim and have the bond cover it since a loss occurred during that bonding period. Okay, so I guess a discovery period is the same thing as an extended reporting period. After coverage ends, you have additional time to file a claim. Um, but for claims made coverage, the extended reporting period is like 60 days. Uh, but on a bond, it's up to one year. Uh, and in commercial crime under law sustained, you have up to one year. Okay. And commercial crime realistically is like a fidelity bond is part of it. So um, coverage and a commercial uh, crime policy is a fidelity bond. And so, yeah, you have a one year discovery period. <clears throat> okay. So if you see extended reporting period, think commercial general liability. But if you hear discovery period, think of it's associated with a bond. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. All right, what else we got? All right. I guess we can call it a night if you have no more questions. Um, go to the upcoming training tab on my website, lgdconsulting.com, uh, to get the link for Friday's webinar. It's going to be two hours, so we're going to go through a, a pretty good fast overview of, of a majority of the coverages um, and yeah definitely the, I'll always leave room for Q&A um, um, if you have questions while we go through that so um, bring your questions good. I'll study. definitely be there good 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 so you do some studying between now and then so on Friday you know if you got weak spots bring them out let's discuss it so you have a better understanding and increase your odds of passing the test okay Okay, thank you so much for that session. Oh, you got it. Well, thank you for joining, uh, spending some time on your uh, Tuesday evening and learning some more. Good luck on your studies, and hopefully I'll see all of you Friday. Yes, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, everybody. And Bye. you said that all the are all the pre-recorded uh, webinars, are they on lgdstudy.com just to watch? Uh, lgdconsulting.com. LGD okay. study is actually just a landing page for registrations, but when you log into LGD consulting and you have the, uh, the access link, um, yeah, I've got a bunch of webinars there more okay. so than I do publicly on YouTube. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. You got it. All right. Take All right. care. You too. Bye.